Oh, automatically recording. I'll just let it go. That's what I was trying to say, but I, I'm very black. We'll, we'll find out for sure. <laughs> yeah, that automatically okay. starts recording this yeah. one. That's Typically, yeah. So this is the this is the meeting now that we're we're in the meeting. We're we're live. Uh, the okay. attendees are are rolling in on mass. Hi everyone, we'll be starting in a minute or so. You can see my screen, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have... Uh enough attendees uh, for now, so we can go ahead and start. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today in uh, our um, medical physics for world benefit uh, seminar series or webinar series rather. Our speaker today is Dr. Peter Sandel, uh, the second Peter. So Peter is a good uh, is a good friend of mine. He was also the past president of our uh, chapter here in uh, 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 Penn, Ohio, and West Virginia. He's going to present to us today about radiating hope and the global expansion of bracket therapy. I'm sorry, I keep jumping. Uh, keep jumping back and forth uh, of high dose rate bracket therapy services. Um, today, Perminder will be helping me uh, moderate this uh, this session, and he'll be uh, um, guiding you with questions and answers to the end of the uh, webinar. So we will start with a 45 minutes uh, presentation from Peter, then followed by questions and answers around five minutes, final comments and thanks another five minutes. And we will have MCQs. I think I'll just exit the, um, the full screen. Um, the MCQs will be sent uh, to you all. Uh, and after you answer them, we will send you certificates of attendance basically. Uh, the webinar will be recorded uh, or is being recorded right now. It will be posted online and shared with the community. You can find it on, or you should be able to find it on the YouTube uh, channel for Medical Physics of World Benefit. So Peter Sandel, uh, the, he's a clinical physicist at Ohio Health in Mansfield, Ohio. He's a first generation Bolivian and second generation Swede. Dr. Sandel has a family, has family in La Paz and Stockholm. This global perspective motivates him to maintain engagement in global health endeavors uh, with ongoing projects in Latin America and West Africa. Dr. Sandal serves on the board of trustees for Radiating Hope. Uh, he's an active independent consultant and instructor at his local community college. He's passionate about his family and helping others. You have more passions also, Peter, but uh, anyways, you can move on. <laughs> but, um, so if for your questions uh, during the webinar, please feel free to write them in the chat box and uh, we'll address them later. They will be brought forward by Perminder, as I said, to the speaker by moderators to answer, to be answered in the questions and answers session. If you want to find our previous webinars, please just scan the QR code and uh, we'll 
Uh, I will give the mic to Peter now and I will stop sharing. Thank you again. And I look forward to the talk. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it, it is it's a nice thing to, to be with friends. So I, I, uh, I appreciate that. Let me hop on and I'm going to share and then F5. Okay. Hopefully this is, you see the title set, the title page. So I have this, this title, I have this title, the Radiant Hope and the Global Expansion of High Dose Rate Brachytherapy Services. Um, I'm not sure it's completely appropriate. It may be, may be more about Radiating Hope, global awareness, and then the importance of high dose rate brachytherapy services globally. So I have an outline here, a brief outline, discussing, uh, you know, talking about what I'll discuss. I'm gonna share a little bit about Radiating Hope, uh, its history, um, what we've learned along the way in, in terms of creating an NGO and, and actually practicing trying to uh, do good. Uh, what global awareness is or what, what, what it means um, to engage globally and the limitations uh, and then, and then I'll talk about HDR brachytherapy. I'll talk about a few technical elements, uh, since our audience is physicists. Uh, some things may be reviewed, and we might we might skip over those. And then the and then program development. Really talk about how do you shape a program? How do you initiate, um, or how do you prepare to initiate a program? So Radiating Hope uh, was founded by some mountain climbing. Uh, radiation oncologists. Uh, they're Brandon Fisher and Larry Doherty. Uh, they're big mountain climbers, and they were they were going all over the world to low and middle income countries where a lot of these peaks are, uh, and, and in particular in Nepal. Uh, and they and in Nepal they noticed there was a limitation of the um, there was a limitation in in the availability of uh, radiation oncology. So they decided, um, let's see if we can help um, bolster the, the availability of radiation oncology in these um, uh, developing areas. So this is, this is the website, uh, and this talks about some of the things they do. And what they do is they, they go on climbs to raise money to purchase radiation uh, equipment. And that, that has been the... the the focus from the beginning is getting equipment to developing areas. Uh, and again, I think Nepal was one of the first, and it was a it was very it's a great success story. There's a HDR unit; they're they're treating patients um, quite regularly, and um, they continue to expand their services. And you can learn more about Radiating Hope on on the website. Um, I'll talk about this one particular case. Uh, and that's Senegal. Senegal was actually, uh, even before Nepal, I believe, Senegal might have been the, the, the first um, donation. So we've got a little map for, Senegal, for Nepal. HDR unit went in there. HDR unit also went into Senegal. And I, I chose Senegal to share because it also, sh we learned a lot of lessons. So in 2012, the, an afterloader was donated. Uh, th there was training performed. There was training done uh, again in 2013. When they went for a return visit, there were no, there was no source. The the, the HDR unit would, had gone dormant, and this is something I've seen again and again uh, in in some of the do these donations. Is you you get the equipment and the the plan isn't there for sustainability, and so this is this is a, a this is a hard pill, but this is a, this is an important lesson. And the truth is, what I've learned is that many people have learned this before me, and many people will probably learn this after me. But it, it's really good if we can if we can share this knowledge and and um, and, and push it forward. So. They, they do have another HDR unit there and a, and a Swiss team has has returned and helped um, training and they, they are they are treating again, but that, that's that was not without hiccups. And so 
I want I want to share this 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 fact or this this and this it's a can it's not a it, it's not that they do hurt but that they can hurt and there's there's a lot of stuff on that um I don't know if you can see me but there's um there's a book called Dead Aid that talks about um how these donations and these aid can actually be detrimental uh, and there's a wonderful video um it's by a, a professor at um at Duke, he's a, he's actually a biomedical engineer, and he talked about how he created an NGO and and with the the, the hope of of donating medical uh, used medical equipment into developing countries, and he has this really really good story. Uh, and this is a TEDx talk. I'm going to share his. I have my own, but but I I liked his. So he he was in a a surgery, and everything was very intense, and they're they're working on the uh, uh, on a child. It was a pediatric surgery. And then all of a sudden the surgical lights caught fire. The, there was, a, this is a big, you know, the, the, these bright surgical lights caught fire. Everyone ca was calm and, and they so called somebody in, they put out the fire, they switched the light bulbs and he, and he was, he looks at it and he said, Hey, those aren't the right light bulbs. The, you know th those light bulbs you, you know those are going to catch fire that's what the, and that's obviously what had happened the 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 person who had replaced the light bulbs turned around and looked at him and said we know that these this lamp was donated to us we don't have the light bulbs available to us and we can't afford the light bulbs that go into this particular system so this these, these catch fire every once in a while and we and we just deal with it so there's just something that to to be aware of. You might think that this equipment that you're going to donate is, is useful. It, it, it may have its own drawbacks. So what we've done is we've switched away. We've moved away from donations. And what we, we've realized is that education is something that really is lasting. And, and it is impactful in, in larger ways. So, you know, they say about um, teaching a man to fish, you know, so, so rather than give, or, or rather than giving something away, or uh, you actually work on developing the infrastructure for things to be lasting. And that's, that's where Radiating Hope has gone. Uh, and I want to talk about, share about two other uh, physicists who work with Radiating Hope. There's lots of physicians and, and there's, there's a few other uh, physicists, Adam Shulman, um, he helped with the the, the Senegal project. Uh, Matt Goss, he's he's helping with something um, in the Ukraine right now. So one of the things that Adam did was uh, connect with Rayos Contra Cancer um, and Ben Lee's group, and they helped um, create HDR brachytherapy um, educational programs um, that have been repeated, and and a lot of those lessons are available on YouTube. So this is something that took a lot of human effort and is lasting and will doesn't need replacement bulbs doesn't need any of that but helps build the capacity helps build the human the human knowledge another project that that matthew is uh, been has been leading it, it, it's hard to see him he's right under the four ukraine um uh this is an educational program strengthening the, the medical physics knowledge in Ukraine right now. It's ongoing. I see Edward uh, gave one of the lectures for 3D dose calculations, and I see some other, uh, some other familiar names. And this is something that will pay dividends in, in the long run. And so they're really trying to strengthen the medical physics education. And back to kind of radi how Radiating Hope engages in this, um, we organize climbs. There, there are climbs that are organized that raise funds to support endeavors like this, and also equipment donations. We haven't we haven't completely forgotten about how we started, and there is a they, we have helped ship a uh, um, uh, a linear accelerator to U Ukraine. There there's there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be rebuilt, uh, and there's a lot of um, equipment that needs to be changed over. So, and, and Matt is leading this climb, Mount Hood. If you're interested, check it out. 
Um, that's a domestic for the United States. It's a climb. So let's let's get back to kind of like um, what's global. So I'm I'm sharing this map um, because I want to I want to share the fact that I don't have a full global perspective, no matter how hard I try. I am limited. I don't even share daylight with a lot of people. There's a, there's only a there's only a short there's only a small percentage of the of the planet that I share daylight with. I have some knowledge of of South America based on on family ties and um and in Latin America based on efforts and then and then also Northern Europe again family ties and through fortune I've um. I've made some great friends in, in West Africa and I've tried to focus my efforts there. But what I realize is that my perspective is limited. I only know what I know. And I, and I know that it's not, I don't know anything about Asia. Uh, I know, I know very little about Indonesia, which is an amazing place. Um, there's, there's just a lot in this world. Uh, and so what I'm going to share, I mean, I know about three, HDR manufacturers. Uh, I think that there are more. I'm actually pretty confident that there are more. And, and if they're not more, there should be. And um, so I'm open to the fact that that what I'm going to share is is very limited. It's limited to my my perspective. So here's another uh, here's another map. This one is actually this was created by a uh, a botnet. So this this was essentially a virus that infected a lot of Internet of Things items back in 2012. And what it did is it had all these different things ping during throughout the day. So you could map the activity of connectivity or, or the, the activity of connectivity throughout the day. So you see that the, the heat map, it gets it gets more intense during the day and the evening, and then it cools off at night. And what you also will notice is that Places like Africa, where there's a lot of people, there's a lot of dark spots. There's a lot of um, lack of connectivity, and so there's there's a there's a there's a lot of um, the 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 communication channels aren't there. Of course, this is in 2012, and the world is changing. More um, fiber optics are being laid, and this is again this is actually also, also kind of a two dimensional map. We're entering a, a a new world with with Starlink and other satellite communication systems. That hopefully there'll be less um, there'll be less blackout zones and the the, the increased communications, increased commu uh, connectivity will also increase um, or improve economic conditions. So let's get back to uh, radiation. Well, atoms for peace, not Tom York. At all, and this is this is for Parmander. Um, this is an American super band, but again, this is this is contextual. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm actually talking about Dwight Eisenhower, and uh, and Dwight Eisenhower. Um, this is this is a picture of him with stamps commemorating this Adams for Peace concept. Um, it wasn't just stamps that came out of this. Here's a there's a series of books. Uh, radiation biology and medicine is 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 one of them, um, but it, it was a speech he gave to the United Nations in in 1953. Um, Dwight Eisenhower was he was there in World War II and and he would he oversaw the dropping of the bomb. So after this, there was a lot of fear and a lot of concern about what nuclear power and what nuclear energy meant to the world, and he. He had a speech, he gave a speech called, entitled Atoms for Peace that encapsulated kind of, it was very open about the fear that was um, that followed the bomb, but it also tried to redirect that and talk to about, and it ended with this really important quote that was commemorated with the stamp. And it's that the inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. The inventiveness of man should be dedicated to his, not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. I, I, I'm sorry, I, re, I repeated it in my in my slide, but it's it's worth repeating. Just it's 
that our ingenuity will be towards healing and not towards weapons. And that was the whole concept of Atoms for Peace. Um, and that's the founding principle of the IEA. Um, the, this, for the, for the long, longest time, they were the Atoms for Peace agency. I think that they're now the Atoms for Peace and Development. So now we're moving back towards radiation and, and about how we're trying to make the world better with our scientific knowledge. So brachytherapy. So brachytherapy um, really became, so brachytherapy has been going on for a long time, starting with, with, with radium, but the nuclear reactors, fission products uh, like cesium-137, and then activation products like iridium um, really changed the game. And brachytherapy is mandatory for the curative treatment of invasive cervical cancers. Now, I'm focusing on cervical cancers just for a moment because this is part of the, the, the goal um, of the World Health Organization is to eliminate cervical cancer within the next century. They've set a 90, 70, 30, uh, 90, 70, 90 targets to be reached by, by 2030. This is to vaccinate 90% of girls, screen 70% of women, and treat 90% 90 with cervical cancer. Even with this reaching these goals, we're gonna be fighting cervical cancer for the next 70 years, um, at least. So we need to build up the capacity to treat the, 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 these, these women with cervical cancer. This is a curable disease. And if you think about, um, if you think about how, um, you think about how important our mothers are, our sisters are, our daughters are, uh, this is actually the lifeblood of, uh, of society. So there's a lot of IEA documents on this too, um, about how to manage it uh, in, in low resource um, settings, and then also tools for, for planning, planning uh, radiotherapy. So this is a great use case for discussing brachytherapy. It's not the only use case. Um, brachytherapy, as many of you know, uh, brachy is derived from uh, the Greek word for short, uh, because um, we're putting the source of radiation, the uh, very close to the, the tumor target. And cervical cancer is uh, uh, an example of intracavitary. There's also interstitial where we use needles. Um, but we we are able to treat, uh, we're able to treat the cervix really effectively with brachytherapy and avoid um, the, the healthy tissue. So it's, it's able, we're able, and we're able to give it a very high dose the bladder and the rectum receive a much lower dose. Now there's, there's the traditional pear-shaped dose volume um, that's created with brachytherapy, whether it's with low dose, low dose rate um, using cesium or high dose rate using iridium or cobalt-60. It should be noted that um, the iridium and the cobalt-60, I'll touch on it a little bit, they're, they're, you're able to get similar dose distributions. The One of the big differences is that the the source wire doesn't shield the cobalt 60 like the um, like it does with iridium, and so the traditional dimple you might see with a with a pear with the pear shape goes away, and it actually becomes a little bit more rounded at the at the end. So why high dose rate brachytherapy? Why not why not low dose rate? The, those sources last longer. Well, high dose rate you can. You can treat more. You can treat more cancers. You can treat more more different types of cancers: do lung, esophagus, breast, endometrium, head and neck. It, it's and it's very. Um, the initial cost of of HDR may be high, but you have a a larger capacity to treat. You can treat more patients, so you get economy of uh, of uh, scale, and that can that can offset the initial investment. And the, I want to. I'm going to talk about economics in here uh, throughout here because it's important. You've got to justify the, the costs on that, and it's important to, to look ahead for the costs. So if you're going to be an advocate for HDR, um, one of the things that administrators understand and regulators and legislators is, is the cost and the benefit. And economics and health are intertwined. Healthy communities lead to healthy economies. 
And if you don't have a healthy economy, that can lead to uh, an unhealthy community. Um, I have I have friends in Nigeria, and I understand what's going on with the, the the inflation. We think we have it bad. It's off the charts. And so that really goes into how much does a bag of rice cost? And that's real. So economics cannot be ignored. So let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, the, the technical aspects. So I talked about, you know, it started where there was radium and then there was there was cesium. And that, but high dose rate brachytherapy really took off in the 70s. Um, iridium was used before, but they were able to miniaturize the sources and put it on, putting it on the end of a wire. And, and if you look at these sizes, we're talking about the, the size of a grain of rice, um, very small. When they're welded to these to these wires, um, it, it's, it's actually a very simple system. It's, uh, it's, it doesn't have nearly as many subsystems as a linear accelerator. So these are very robust. It pushes the wire out and it pulls it back in. And by allowing, by pulling it back in at, with steps or pushing it out with steps, you're able to create uh, conformal dose distributions. You're able to shape the dose. And here um, we have um, cylinders and you, you, you can actually see the, the dimple there um, with uh, the, the, with the um, iridium source, with the again with the cobalt source, it's, it's these these dimples are kind of rounded out. So these are the remote afterloaders that that I'm aware of, and I mentioned that before. I know that there are others. Um, one of the wake up calls for me was actually um, engaging with the with Ukraine, realizing that a lot of their afterloaders were provided by Russia, and um, what that means for the future and how how those how they go about replacing those is it's a it's their own complex problem, but I think it's good that Russia is providing afterloaders to someone, and I think that you know if if China's providing these, uh, if you're in Africa, Northern Europe and and America doesn't have to be your first choice, um, but uh, you should understand um, how your system works. And one of the things I would like to draw attention to is the step motion. This is one of the um, largest sources of error in HDR. Different manufacturers um, either work by pushing the source out or pulling the source in. And one of the most common errors occurs when someone who's used to working with one set of equipment moves to another set of equipment and they put their starting point at the wrong position. So if you put your starting point at the beginning of the tumor, um, because you're used to forward stepping, or if you put your, your, your starting point at the end of the tumor, because you're used to source pulling. So those things will create, um, they'll flip the, door, the dose distribution. And that's just something to, to be aware of, that that step motion is important. Um, now, most of these, these these systems, the ones that I was I, I've worked with, have used iridium. Recently, um, and, and I'm I'm understanding it's not so it's not so recent internationally. It's just more recent um, in my awareness. Uh, cobalt sixty um, is used, and they've miniaturized cobalt sixty sources uh, to work with the flexitron, which also works with iridium, uh, and then the bevy uh, multi source. Um, to work with cobalt 60. And there are advantages to, to the, the cobalt 60. Obviously it's five year half-life um, is significantly longer than, than iridium uh, 192s. The, the cost of source exchange is not to be minimized and um, needs to be taken into consideration. So some other considerations that, that when you're implementing um, HDR, some technical considerations or shielding um, these are just rules of thumb. There are there are lots of um, documentation on this. Um, but for iridium, you need about four cm of lead um, or about thirty five centimeters of concrete. And for cobalt sixty, 
essentially add 15 centimeters of, of concrete. So um, you have to 50 centimeters of concrete. And obviously, uh, shielding designs, uh, you can you can find an old one, and that's great if you can plug and play, but everyone's got to work within their own space. And so sometimes you need to get creative, especially when space is limited or they're, they're retrofitting a, a, an area. So it's important to um, ask for help um, if, if this isn't something you do regularly, or at least ask for someone to review um, the work that you've done. Another, another important um, consideration with brachytherapy and high dose rate brachytherapy in particular is the security. Um, these are some of the, these, some of these um, terms are American terms. Um, all this stuff is controlled by your local codes and regulations, uh, your um, codes and conditions. Um, but typically you're gonna need a locked room with access control to the room. Uh, I know that um, a lot of sources in, uh, are now controlled with uh, biometrics. Uh, they need to, there needs to be a locked and fixed container. Um, and there needs to be the capability of detecting the removal. So they're monitors. Um, and there's also, it needs to be continuous surveillance, uh, needs to be controlled area. And again, access control to these areas. There's a lot of concern about um, these sources being misappropriated. And if you're, if you want to implement brachytherapy, I'm sure that there, there is, um, there are regulations you need to follow within your own specific area. And if they're not, um, that's a good place to, to help get engaged in terms of developing the radiation safety infrastructure to support it. So now I'm going to kind of move over or, or, or move over to the, the, um, the infrastructure. So like how to uh, develop a, and implement a brachytherapy service line. So a few, a few things, the infrastructure, the investments that are required, the imaging options, and, and something I, I'd really, um, workplace design, location and layout, like how things are set up. This is critical, um, is how you set these things up. And, you know, there's the, um, there's the, the art of feng shui or, or flow, the, the, how, how movement occurs. This is, these are things to, to think about and to consider in your design. So infrastructure, there, there, are, there are different things. There's operational factors. So how are things gonna be moving about? So you need radiation safety, the, the regulations and how um, you're gonna be compliant. Um, if you're using existing facilities, how are you gonna uh, adapt your existing facilities? How are you gonna leverage your existing facilities? How are you gonna work with your existing facilities? Uh, human resources, do you have the expertise that you need? Do you need to, to, to build that expertise? How, do you, how are you gonna go about doing that? And, and going back to kind of um, the economic justification or, the, or, or even the human health justification, what is your patient volume? Who, um, who are you currently treating or who do you intend to treat? What is the incidence of this, of this disease in your area? Uh, like this, is, this is from the, the IEA program. And cervix, again, uh, is a big focus. It's also one of the, the, the major uses but all these other ones are um, potential um, are, are potential patients that can benefit from uh, high dose rate brachytherapy. Uh, in fact, I know that there are several uh, there's a, there's a, there's several groups of trainers going out trying to work on uh, improving the ability for people to use prostate brachytherapy. Uh, in the United States, we're we're, we're pushing towards um, a lot of SBRT for prostate. HDR is a very viable option, um, and it you can't get more conformal than having the than having the source right there. There's no entrance, no exit. It's a minimal exit, but the um, certainly not not the the, the entrance dose. 
So there's also clinical steps to be reviewed. So um, that goes back to the flow. So you really need to, to examine how you intend to implement it at your facility based on your layout, based on your staffing, who's gonna put in the applicator, um, when they're gonna put in the applicator, what imaging do you have available? What imaging are you going to use? Um, and and one of the things I, I'm not sure that I, I, I don't think I, I covered it too much is this uh, ultrasound. A lot of people are trying to work on ultrasound. Ultrasound is uh, a low cost and, and very reliable. Traditionally, we've done a lot of uh, radiography, um, but there are more than one way to peel an orange. And based on your resources, just because we do it one way in our one place doesn't mean you can't do it in another way in your place and make it just as effective and, and just as reliable. So how, who is going to do the treatment planning? How are you going to do the treatment planning? And, and that one of the things about the treatment planning is are you actually going to do treatment planning? This is this is a this is a weird question, but do you need to do treatment planning, or can you use a library of plans? Can you use a series of templates? Will that provide uh, the adequate level of quality? And the truth is, it will. It can. Um, you can be more. You can be more cons uh, conformal. You can be. You can um, be more precise. Does the, is that is that worth the cost or do you even have the resources to expend on that? And I'll touch on that again. And again, where's the treatment delivery gonna occur? This is from the AAPM task group uh, 59, which is, I think they're in the process of revising, um, but there's the, the HDR procedure flow. Um, so this is with a, with a one medical physicist model. The interesting, the interesting point here uh, is that they have a dosimetrist. And I know that internationally, um, physicists are dosimetrists. So you can collapse these two, these two lines. Um, the physicist maybe will verify the source positioning, review the films, um, perform the treatment planning, or select the appropriate template, um, and then deliver the, the, the programming parameters. And then it, again, here's the, here's, the, here's the crux, who's double checking you. And, so you may need to change this to work for your um, your particular staffing model. So maybe that maybe it's the 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 therapist who's who's verifying the, the the plan calculations, or maybe you don't have a therapist. Maybe it's the radiation oncologist that's doing that. Um, and I've seen that. I've seen a physicist and a radiation oncologist do the whole thing. So there are lots of different ways to do this. It just needs to be very clear how you're doing this uh, and having it mapped out. So investments, this, this costs a lot of money. These are old numbers. I think, I think this, this pro forma is from like 2005 or something like that. These numbers aren't really, um, they're, they're not real uh, or they may have been real at some point, but they are no longer valid. What they are, they can serve as, as an example or a template for how you might go about estimating your equipment costs. Um, the, the finances, um, there's the there's actually the physical equipment, but then there's the human resources. Both of those require ongoing um, investment, uh, and whether that's investment in, in, in education um, and or in, investment in source exchange. I can't stress that one enough. It, it's really painful. Um, uh, I know that there was a, uh, an HDR afterloader uh, donated by the IEAE to a particular location, and they did not budget for source exchange. So it's gone. That program went dormant. Um, hopefully, they'll they'll reallocate those funds. But these are the kind of sustainability issues that really need to be addressed on the front end to make something last. Um, obviously construction, you need to build your, your bunker or or, um, or facility, hospital, um, your equipment, uh, the service and the staff. And, and I, can't, I can't stress the service enough. Um, that just needs to be um, accounted for. And I feel like that's one of the lessons 
I learned about equipment donation, um, due to liability, a lot of um, vendors won't service a donated piece of equipment. It, 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 it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel good. I'm not sure that it is right or is good, uh, but it is, it is the way that these, these organizations operate. So something to consider when, when, when trying to do a donation is service on this equipment available uh, is it something that can um, be provided? Again, you gotta you gotta figure out who who you need um, and what those costs are gonna be. So let's go to the imaging. There's lots of different types of um, of ways to to provide these these um, treatments. Historically, we've used film. We used planar radiography. This is on a, this is an old. Um, C arm uh, simulator with the with the with the couch and it's all kind of got a, a shared ISA center. Um, and of course, you can use a just a a, a C arm fluoro too. And this is to verify the the placement of the the tandem in the ovoids, and it just just doing orthogs, so APPA and a lateral. And this is this is probably the maybe the one of the lower cost um, options. I think ultrasounds even lower cost, and and that's why that's should be explored further. Uh, another one, CT simulator, obviously gives you uh, the ability to do three dimensional dose um, planning or three dimensional treatment planning. And for many years, we just planned off points. Um, I think a lot of centers now are are doing volumetric planning, where they're actually um, drawing. Um, high risk CTVs and and creating PTVs and ensuring that those are those areas are covered um, with either with the use of just CT alone or or, or even um, better yet um, MR. However, this is this this costs a lot of money. MRs are not cheap. This is actually a permanent magnet. So this is probably one of the lower cost um, options available. The the challenge of, of implementing some of these um, higher level, uh, higher quality imaging, uh, you're likely going to need to use this between treatments. So you're going to be moving the patient uh, in and out. You're also going to need, that's going to um, go into your considerations for the, the uh, applicators that you use and that you uh, uh, making sure that they're MR compatible, but it does allow you to much better delineate uh, the target um, and the question. Again, I go back to you can do better um, and you should do better if you can. And if, but don't feel bad if you're doing a template plan because those are going to provide a very similar outcome. And we're trying to do the most. Um, we're doing, do the good for the most. So, workplace design this is the location and layout issue. So if you're building from the ground up, this is great. You can, you can design the flow the, um, the way that you'd like. Um, you have certain things that you need. You need a place to put in the applicator. You need a place to deliver the, the, um, the treatment. Uh, you need an imaging system. And uh, if you're doing um, three-dimensional planning or if you're using a, a planning system, you're going to need a, a planning room. So the proximity of these, these, how close these things are together that influence, influences the flow and efficiency, it really, it really can shape um, the productivity of your program too. So anesthesia and sterility or the need for those items may be rate limiting. Those, those may be the issues um, that, that, that kind of, if you've got a sterile room, um, that you're you're doing interstitial implants in, um, that may not be uh, where you're going to be doing your imaging or your um, your implant. Ideally, though, you will minimize movement. Any any movement transfer from table to table is an opportunity for the the applicators to be displaced, and then whatever plan you came up with to not be delivered as um, as developed. So these are these are things to, to, to consider. So there's there's three main um, kind of uh, 
room layout options. Uh, there's there's one with a shared use, uh, so an existing operating or procedure room, um, such as a simulator. Uh, and then there's 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 ones with the um, a, a separate uh, treatment room for the applicator insertion, um, where the imaging is performed elsewhere. Now, if you are going to again move the patient, uh, you're going to want to do it as, uh, 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 as gingerly as possible. There are obviously like those sliding boards. Uh, there are also kind of um, other systems. Zephyr is one of the first ones I knew about. I think I think lots of other manufacturers make these now, kind of like air hockey tables. So they really slide over the patient without any kind of um, without any without jarring. Uh, again, these are also idealizations. These are these are what we would like to see in an, in an ideal world. I've done many. I've shared the lifting of many of patients pulling the sheet and setting them down. From a t from a from a gurney to the CT. So, but ideally, we would minimize movement. Uh, one of the the other designs is is an integrated brachytherapy suite. This is kind of this is the dream. Um, is having your imaging system, your uh, and your afterloader in the same place. So you set them up on the on the table that they'll be imaged on, and you. Um, you deliver the treatment on that same table. No movement uh, or minimize minimal movement. And um, you, you ideally you're delivering what you claim. Um, this is the most expensive option. So it's not always an option, but if you have the capital uh, or have the, the, uh, the resources to do this, then I think this is the way to go. Um, there are some drawbacks to this and I'll, uh, I'll touch on that in a bit. So going back to, you know, the, the very beginning of the designing. So map your process, map your, your pro. And what I can say by that map your process, there's lots of these process maps available. They may not be applicable to you. They may not be applicable to your particular layout, how you design your facility. Make sure that you found your most efficient path, um, and and some of these some of these items right here, I I, I stole from a, 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 a Andrew Farosh Farosh um, uh, out at uh, Houston Methodist. Uh, my friend uh, Archie uh, shared these slides. Some of these slides with me. So practically familiarize your staff with the procedures, um, and that's not that's not just um, the the few people that are in your um, that are either inserting the the, the uh, applicator or doing the plan, but those are the the the, the supporting staff. Those are the reporting the, the referring uh, physicians, so they know what to expect. Uh, the anesthesia, um, the the diff other um, and by clinic the, the administrative staff, the the OR staff. It's really important that 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 everyone knows what's going on, knows what their expectations are. Uh, and and what they need to do in case of an emergency. Uh, and so in services, regular in services are important. Process maps, I'm, I'm, I'm hammering that again, um, mapping it out, mapping it out. And then team meetings, kind of huddles. Um, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? How can we do better? Uh, these are important things. So one of the, one of these, this goes back into the the, the design, and I, I mentioned how that integrated suite uh, is kind of ideal. It is if you've got the the resources. If throughput is important, you may want these to be separated and sit into different rooms so that you can be doing different tasks at different time points, and that can allow you to treat more patients. These these graphics are from a um, a success story. This is um, this is uh, in Nicaragua. Yeah, uh, University of um, Florida had partnered with them uh, very strongly and has been um, working with them over the years to ensure their success. Um, and they they use uh, again um, uh, template plans and.
they they really they have a focus on efficiency because they've got a large burden they get a large amount of need so they're able to treat 10 patients a day um by by de developing these efficiencies and that's that's great um some things you're going to want to do is you know if you're if you're going to be so we talked about a lot about we talked a lot about, about cervix but if you're going to do another procedure like prostate you want to prepare that ahead of time um practice runs um, and prepare for the unexpected. Again, have those huddles, have those post-mortems, uh, review when bad things occur, review when good things occur and, and continually improve your process maps and the safety um, between those, those different uh, actions. Commission all your applicators, um, you know, again, meet and discuss and, and remember, safety is a first principle and efficiency is a second principle. But just like uh, economics and health, these things are intertwined. Uh, a, an efficient process is a safe process. Uh, this is, I've always said this, you know, minimize the, the steps. You've minimized the opportunities for error. So an efficient process is a safe process. Again, going back to this, this all this stuff costs money. Um, you're going to want to make a list of what you need, what you want, and even what you what you wish you had. Um, be prepared to build as you go and be strategic. Be, uh, get what you need to deliver um, uh, base quality and then to improve and, and grow. Uh, and I, I think it's, it's often taken for granted that, um, that uh, we started out doing 2D in the in, in developed world or whatnot. And now we're doing SBRT, but we've also, a lot of us have had the uh, opportunity of growing throughout that process. Um, in the developing world, they're, they're, some of these people are just hitting the hitting the accelerator and and going all the way to the state of the art uh, from the beginning. And, and I think there's some hazards in that. So I, I like the idea of, of growing. Um, and 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 growth. So again, realize that this is an ongoing um, expense. This is not um, this is not a one and done. Um, you don't just you don't just get the the, the million dollars and you've got a thing. You you you've got to get a million dollars and then you've got a budget for half a million dollars a year or whatnot. Um, and there are different. There, this is kind of more for administrations. Um, you know, capital expenditures versus operational expenditures. All of these have to be well outlined and um, planned for. All right, I um, I was really worried about if I'd have enough time, and I look, I think I did go too too long. But uh, these are the key points. So, have an awareness of your patient population, your staffing needs, and your available facilities. Uh, what do you need to start and maintain a program? Um, what are the costs and benefits to your imaging technology and what uh, selection? And remember that location and layout matters. I, and I, I really like this quote. Um, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. So be mindful about your layout and how you do and how you set the program up. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Peter, for that wonderful talk. Um, so full of uh, useful information. And uh, very inspirational. I love the, I love all the quotes that you put in. The meet Adam for peace. Uh, really, really appreciated all of it. Um, so we'll go to a, a couple of quick questions. We don't have a lot of time. I want to be mindful of people. You know, of the of the time people have, and we only have an hour for the entire um, session. Um, so I will not be able to get through all the questions that were posted. A wonderful uh, questions. Really love the engagement. Um, but there were a few here. I think there's some some interesting themes here that are worth uh, getting some perspective on. Uh, one has to do with um, the the sort of the fleet of equipment and the age of the equipment that uh, is available out there. And many of these devices are no longer being asked, you know serviced. Uh, and but you think of you think of these HDR uh, sources uh, or these uh, afterloader systems. And whether they could be, you know, continuously used because, in effect, there. I mean, there there are very efficient ways of delivering cancer care. So the question um, was, how do, how do you is there value in having um, training people and how to use these older pieces of equipment for their own servicing 
particularly given um, that they would no longer be under a service contract, provided that they could ac get access to a source. What, do, what are your thoughts on that? I, you know, it, I actually love it. And I, I think that there's a lot of creativity in the world. Um, these systems aren't that complex. I think that that individuals could be um, trained to service these um, aging equipment. I think, and the truth is, I believe that um, a lot of places could manufacture their own. I think some of the some of the devices that you see, and, and this is I'll just share a, a quick thing. I have a friend who built his his elevator. He built an elevator. He got the he got a motor. He got a um, a motion sensor. He built an elevator. And if you think about it, it's not much different. It's it's just a pulley system. Um, so yes, I, I do think that that's a, a that, that's a great opportunity. And I think that um, there should be some, some training on on servicing of um, older equipment at um, technical colleges. Yeah, I think I, I, th I agree that even just having opportunities to train people on the electromechanics and providing a base of uh, that knowledge in a, in a hospital environment would be valuable. Um, and along those lines, it, it kind of, there was some other themes here about the, there seems to be this general trend of actually reducing the number of radioactive sources in particularly high income countries um, for fear of safety concerns and things of that nature. Um, how, what are your thoughts on that? Like, do you, do you feel that these efforts are sort of limiting access to cancer care or do you, or what do you think that these are uh, legitimate concerns, uh, you know, in, in security? What, share some thoughts on that. Uh, it's, it's my opinion, it's letting the terrorists win. It's fear-based. <laughs> so, and, and, and it actually, it, it increases the costs. I know that for, for places that we have relationships with, we have strong and strict security controls. I, um, so I don't agree with it. I also believe that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And I know that individuals are working on other methods to deliver these. Uh, this is some kind of out there stuff, but there is pl plasma wake field accelerator. And there's, a, there's actually, a, there's a patent for this out there using fiber optics to send the lasers down to, to activate a plasma uh, field that, that would then treat similar to um, a HDR source. That's That may be a, a ways off, but I think that there are other opportunities. I think that the micro um, X-ray sources, such as Zoft, things like that, those things can be improved upon and um, deliver similar treatments. I also know that we are still supplying these sources and um, delivering these sources. Um, I am discouraged um, by the barriers that we've placed, but I know that that we're also trying to um, eliminate those barriers. I think in the United States, why we've used less of it is because we've been pushing towards SBRT. But those are much more complex systems. Right. Um, great answer. Um... Another question that came up is it was in relation to training, um, and I, these are these are very sophisticated pieces of equipment to to learn how to operate and use. I, I know that um, that there is a, a colleague up in Toronto, uh, uh, Hamza Nusrat, who's working on some VR related um, technologies for training. Um, so, what are your thoughts on on that? Like, can can we leverage? Are there or can we? Um, leverage uh, VR technologies to improve the training elements uh, for HDR uh, or brachytherapy. Oh yeah, definitely. And I, I just saw, um, I just saw like an augmented reality kind of example of training where they were, they had the individual with with the the helmet on, and then they were um, being guided towards um, and um, um, implanting interstitial needles in a phantom. And I, I think that there's lots of opportunities there. And I think that that, will, that space will only continue to grow. And then you may even have an expert over your shoulder um, helping you for your first 10 cases to, 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 to get your proficiency. One, one final question for you is, do you think that there is a business or a use case model for explicitly standalone HDR facilities in places like low, low and middle income countries? 
That's a, that's a, that's an interesting one. Um, I do, I do. Uh, it's it's interesting because what we're you're essentially, we're essentially saying is um, is there a use case for an SBRT facility, highly conformal um, delivery? I think it depends again on the patient population. If you if you have um, a lot of prostates, you have a lot of um, cervical cancer. You can treat those effectively with HDR as a monotherapy. Ideally, um, you're going to want to treat nodes with a larger field of radiation, but I think you can still do a lot of good with HDR alone. Yeah, I just as a, an extra comment, uh, those tend to be the most diagnosed or the highest incidence of cancer in low and middle income countries. Are these um, the cancers that we take for granted are much more easily detected or have higher thorough screening programs in North America and other places, high income countries like, like prostate cancer and, and gynecological cancers. So, so I can, I can, I can see that, uh, that argument. Um, anyways, any final comments from you before we close our session? No, I just, I want to say thank you to everyone for attending. Um, and I, I, I'm pleased to see a lot of friends and um, I want to just thank everyone, including um, a lot of my international friends who've taught me a whole lot. I appreciate it all. Well, great. Um, once again, thank you so much for your time. I know it's very precious. You're an incredibly busy person. Um, so we're very uh, lucky to have you uh, give us an hour of your time. Um, I wanna thank all of our attendees for uh, for participating and sending us your wonderful questions, many of which we weren't able to to, to answer, but we will try or do our best to, to get back to you. We will have some um, multiple choice questions that will be generated for those that would like to get a certificate of attendance. Um, so that will be forthcoming in the next couple of days. Um, so please keep uh, keep your keep your mailboxes uh, on alert for uh, an email for those attendees uh, to get access to those questions. Um, other than that, I think um, is there anything else I'm missing, Sarah? No, yeah, I did well. I just would like I would like to encourage people to visit uh, and join if they would like uh, the website of uh, Medical Physics for World Benefit. That's www.mpwb.org, and I would like to just add uh, a thank you note to the uh, WPM uh, HQ, especially for Hanukkah Khan and uh, MPWB um, board. In addition, of course, to thanking Peter and you and all our attendees. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.